it occurred to me that um, I would um, hold seances, and I did this. So fast forwarding, uh, I decided I wanted to hold them in public um, because I, I thought maybe I could, I could shoot in public spaces and call that an installation, um, the way I think PJ Harvey has recently recorded an album in public space and has called that an installation. Um, but it really is just shooting a movie. But I managed to get some space in the Centre Pompidou in Paris and another, uh, and in, uh, for three weeks where I shot one movie a day, one lost movie, adaptation, a day. And I managed to get another three weeks in Montreal at the uh, Centre Phi, uh, Phi, Phi Center, uh, for another three weeks. And I shot one movie, a lost movie adaptation there, a day. But I called them seances. And uh, every day I would gather actors around. And I managed to get some really cool, I got the Quebecois uh, movie star system. I got all the best actors there. I was really lucky. And I got some really cool actors in Paris to come out. And I every day, I would just put, uh, put the actors into a trance, which is very easy to do. Actors are forever tipping themselves into trances. And, and then I would invite, and I did this sort of in public, well, just um, people, about this many people sometimes would be watching. I would invite the spirit of a lost film that happened to be out there in some sort of limbo. Because I started to think of these, these lost films as films with no known um, um, final resting place, that they were restless spirits doomed to wander the landscape of film history, forever unhappy, forever unable to project themselves for people who might see them. So I thought I would invite one of these unhappy spirits to come down and possess my actors, which they, they did, and, uh, and compel those actors to act out its long forgotten plots. Um, uh, and then I would spend the day just as a spirit photographer collecting their images and thus satisfy some of the whatever, whatever hunger that had been, uh, I'm just going to mix a metaphor, that had been haunting me, a hunger that had been gnawing at me uh, to see these narratives and uh, just see what they looked like. Of course, I was a fraud because I had to write scripts for the actors, and, um, and so I did. Um, the first thing I'm going to show you, what happened then is um, I decided to um, uh, make a website where anyone online could um, sit down and have a seance with lost cinema. And there'd be this really complicated website which mixes up uh, fragments of all the adaptations I made until they're recombined into a single viewing experience. Um, a, a unique movie with a title generator and everything uh, that produced a unique title. The fr and uh, we're working on the software now. It'll be launched in, in, um, on the program now. It'll be launched in the winter. Uh, the first randomly generated title made up entirely out of lost film material remade by me um, was called Wise Trumpets of the Milky Midnight. And I pronounced the random title generator success based on that. I watched, I watched the movie, which is a non sequitur addled collision of a bunch of my movies shredded up into little pieces. And it seemed OK, I guess. <laughs> and, so, and then the program lost Wise Trumpets of the Milky Midnight because the program both creates movies out of lost films and then intentionally loses them. So now I've made my first lost movie that's officially lost forever, Wise Trumpets of the Milky Midnight. <laughs> Moment of silence. There, that's enough. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I was lucky enough uh, to, to make friends with American poet John Ashbery over the last few years, and I asked him if he was interested in helping out, and he did write a script. Uh, I gave him a big list of lost movies, and I'll show you that one first because I used it as a framing device in this feature film I've made up out of all these, a bunch of lost movies. Now, I, I didn't intend to make a feature film at all. I, I just wanted to work in, um, in new media uh, because I was getting tired of the sound of a Canadian film being slid on a shelf right after it was being complete. And I thought, <laughs> I, will, I will just try, I'll try this new media stuff. But um, it turns out that you can't raise money to make, uh, to make a project that big in new media unless you make a feature film. So I agreed, after I'd shot a bunch of these things, to, to put them into a feature film form. And John Ashbery's script um, was ended up, uh, ended up, has ended up as the framing device for this feature film that I'll show you a few clips from tonight. Uh, this one is um, How to Take a Bath. 
Um, it was by a sexploitation director, Dwayne Esper, who made the movie in uh, 1937. It was lost somewhere between then and now. And um, it ap apparently compared in a split screen the way two women bathed. One of them married, one of them not yet married. Apparently, the married woman was more, you know, kind of comfortable with her body or something, and the unmarried woman, not so much. But the, whole, the real reason for the comparison was just to get to tantalize viewers uh, into thinking they might see some nudity. And, um, and these things played in grind houses. And some of them are, he made, um, he made Reefer Madness, which some of you may have heard of, but he, he did make this uh, short uh, called How to Undress in Front of Your Husband, which is available on YouTube. Uh, you might want to check that out. That's Dwayne Esper. Anyway, John Ashbery wrote this, but I'll just start with the first clip, which is just the opening credits of my movie, The Forbidden Room. There's a weird look to all the footage, which I decided um, I wanted to come up with a, a visual equivalent of ectoplasm somehow, that, you know, that sort of uh, gooey cheesecloth or corn syrup that comes out of mediums' nostrils in old still photographs from the 1920s, uh, but I, uh, you never see it in motion. So I, I, it, it struck me that when a film is dying, when a film is crumbling to dust, it first starts to buckle and when you run that through a projector, um, it's, it starts to look like ectoplasm somehow. And so, uh, through a lot of um, fussy manipulation, I managed to shoot the movie in a kind of ectoplasmo vision. Uh, I just, I haven't, uh, I got to workshop that, uh, I've got to, and then copyright that name uh, once I get it. <laughs> Uh, once I fine-tune it. Um, anyway, let's watch the first few minutes of this thing. Um, what it's supposed to be, it's got a really strange structure, which is based roughly on John Ashbery's favorite writers, uh, Raymond Roussel's structure of nesting Russian doll style, a narrative within a narrative within a narrative within a narrative, and then, you know, a dream within a telegram, within a, within a, a whatever, a, a, an indigestion nightmare within a, you know, um, and then working their way back out, and it's got a basic three-act structure uh, with these concentricities. I think it's six lost movies deep, then nine, and then nine, and then there's a bunch of climactic lost movies spewed out at the end. But the first one is uh, John Ashbery's How to Take a Bath, and maybe we'll just watch it. I'm t I've been talking for way too long already. discuss baths. More specifically, how to take one. Baths have been around for a long time. The ancient Romans built fancy ones, like Caracalla. In the Middle Ages, they were called stews, because you had to be stewed in order to take one. They were open to both sexes. Today, the Japanese have bisexual bathing. Here in America, we didn't bathe so much until recently. The Saturday night bath used to be a ritual. 
Today, it's more like every other day or even every day. How do I know this? People have told me that's how. Start drawing your bath until it gets to the temperature you want. Meanwhile, remove clothing. Carefully insert your big toe in the waters. This will tell you if it's too hot or too cold. Hopefully, it'll be just right. Once in the tub, start soaking. Start with the armpits and work down to the genital area. Work carefully in ever widening circles. Um, so that's just part of um, uh, John Ashbery's, at Dwayne Esper's, how to take a bath. But uh, the, the camera goes into the bathtub and then into a submarine where, um, well, I'll show you a clip from that in a second, where a lost um, Alan Dwan movie, The Forbidden Room, picks up for a while and then, and, um, and so forth and so forth. I wanted to mention it's the, the movie's obviously in color, uh, it has talking, even though many of the, uh, the movies treated are uh, silent films that were originally black and white. It has a modern aspect ratio of 169 instead of the various aspect ratios. I just decided to just, in the spirit of showmanship, <laughs> just to make the movies in color. I just thought the afterlife, where these unhappy spirits were, uh, could be in color uh, or be colorblind. I tried to make uh, the stories uh, colorblind as well in racial terms and genderblind and non-ageist. In other words, I just thought the spirits of the movies could be less literal-minded and they could be more addled or confused and, and that they could sort of come out, um, just come out, express themselves um, through the voice of the medium anyway, that's me, and so they had to be that way. Another uh, little thing I wanted to mention, um, I forgot to mention that there, um, the Khmer Rouge in the 70s in Cambodia um, murdered a lot of filmmakers and destroyed their films, and so there were a lot, uh, I was planning on one time, part of the project collapsed, uh, adapting a number of Cambodian pictures which were really intriguing melodramas. I may get a chance, I may get a chance yet. Um, I want to just speed into the next clip pretty quickly, there, but there were, I, I do want to mention a bit more about this sense of lostness. Um, a few other examples of people that really intrigued me. There is um, um, Maria P. Williams, who is, uh, I believe, the first, uh, you can never be sure, the first African-American woman to make films. Um, um, there was... Um, uh, this guy, James Young Deere, is a Native American, the first Native American to make narrative films in America, except some historians are beginning to, to wonder if he was really Native American. They think he might have been African American, pretending to be Native American because it was just slightly less resistance uh, to, his, to Native American filmmaking than African American filmmaking and these marginal, among marginalized people. And I began to think of, if I, I, I thought, if I'm starting to consider the unrealized films of Jean Vigo as lost, then that um, I would have to consider films unrealized because of political, socio-political uh, marginalization. Uh, I would have to start considering those lost as well. And I had great plans for this project, um, which I had to kind of abort because I realized I could spend the rest of my life working on it. But the idea was that the website would kind of um, keep combining and recombining infinitely a number of new narratives and then losing them until it defined around itself somehow a space of, of the native, uh, uh, the North American native, um, the First Nations genocide, basically. I wanted to, in like Sebaldian terms, walk around until you left an empty space that was this. And th those are my grandiose plans, I admit them, uh, and I've failed to even come close to it, but that was my big goal. You always have to have some kind of a secret mandate when working, and maybe that one was just too ambitious for me, and I'm not the right person to do it anyway. But let's move on to the next uh, clip right away, which is just 
uh, a submarine. I tried to get as many genres um, done as well, a submarine picture, an aviation picture, a volcano virgin sacrifice movie, um, uh, and from as many different countries as possible as well. A Philippine vampire movie. Um, uh, they have different vampires in the Philippines than we do here. Anyway, uh, let's watch the next uh, clip, please. Thank you. Why always flapjacks? I told you. There are air pockets in the batter, these flapjacks. Our oxygen will last almost twice as long with these babies. little hours. Maybe we shouldn't bother the captain after all. We're the jelly boys. Our place is here in the back protecting the jelly. What the stuff is, I couldn't tell you, but it's our job to take care of it. Should he be here? He'd be in the forest. Four men in the forest. As the old bard wrote in one of his lesser known plays, trying to rescue a kidnapped woman. They can't agree on anything, or so the story goes. I'll see here, boys. I know we've been rivals for Margot in the past, but this is an emergency. We must put aside all the dirty tricks we've been happy to play to each other and work together. Yes, but the Red Wolves, the most feared forest bandits in all of Holstein Schleswig. Yes, I know. But we can't let that stop us. They have Margot, and who knows what they're doing to her. Now, I, I, I know um, the peop, you people from um, Holstein Schleswig um, will correct me that it's supposed to be Schleswig Holstein. Um, there's a tradition that uh, many spelling and grammatical and, and factual errors appear in intertitles, and I just bravely decided to start putting them in on purpose, on top of the ones that would appear accidentally anyway. So um, that is an example of one. I've, I've actually been corrected by a couple pe uh, people, but anyway, uh, that. Um, that was an example of just, uh, we all have seen movies with flashbacks. I was inspired by the movie The Locket, uh, a fantastic John Brom movie starring Robert Mitchum and Brian Ahern and a few other, um, Gene Raymond and um, 
Lorraine Day, which has, um, which has a, it's a story within a story within a story within a story, and then within that story. It's the story of three men, each one of them who has loved a woman, um, and it's taking place on, their, on the, th the most recent man's wedding day to that woman, but then a, a man who used to go out with her comes and tries to stop the wedding and tells him a story, and then in that story, he's, his romance to that woman is interrupted by another man who complains about her, and then she tells in the story within those outermost narratives, she tells her story, and at the very heart of that story is a locket, a tiny little silvery vaginal secret holding thing, and then uh, you, uh, there's something that is in that locket that is the cause of all the trouble in the story, and then you work your way back out from the center of that locket through all those various stories to the end, and, it's, and it struck me when I watched this movie, and it was, it's wonderful, it's great, I recommend it. Uh, fantastic melodrama, and it's really smartly put together, and its subject is perfectly suited for that kind of nesting. And I just started wondering, how, wouldn't it be fun to see how many stories within stories within stories within stories you could make? And when um, Telefilm told me that they would only give me money if I made a feature, I realized, ah, oh, man, but this is at least my chance to see how many stories I can fit inside each other. So I, I got 17 stories in this movie. <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's really satisfying coming out of them and actually remembering, hey, I, you know, this, sometimes you come out full 45 minutes after going into a story, and it's, it's kind of satisfying to remember if you're still awake or in the theater. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not for everybody.